Okay. Um, good afternoon and welcome to those of you who are rejoining us and to others who are arriving for the first time to join us. And good morning and a big welcome to the Geological Society to those of you who are joining from the USA and from California and even beyond California. Uh, you'll be interested to know that Tanya was earlier meddled today and we are now greatly looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Um, I first met Tanya a little over 30 years ago and we were amongst an eclectic group of geoscientists that Ian Diel and the NSF had brought together to review his work around the Drake Passage and Antarctic Peninsula in southern Gondwana. Uh, we each, each, each participant had to bring with them a, a couple of talks for the voyage because the boat went from outcrop to outcrop and there was time, lots of time between that. The degree of audience participation in these talks ebbed and flowed with the sea state, it has to be said. But the only talk I really recall 33 years on was Tanya's. And it would be largely because in the midst of it, our trusty vessel, the Polar Duke, changed course with the resultant change from experiencing a moderate pitch to a relatively chaotic and nauseating pitch and roll that in the middle of the Drake Passage had an almost instant effect on the audience and half at least of the people just disappeared and uh, <laughs> were no longer with us. I'm hoping for a calmer event this evening, uh, but one no less impactful as Tanya always has an impact. So Tanya, uh, over to you. Uh, welcome again. Congratulations on the Will Aston Medal. And uh, we're really looking forward to you to tell us about romance in our planet. Thanks a lot, Mike. When uh, Mike actually suggested that I talk about the now ancient history of the plate tectonic revolution, and it was great fun spending a while recalling that and living back in that ancient that ancient time. <laughs> um, I, I decided to record it and it was a big learning curve for all the technology, but I really enjoyed it too. And I really, it was so fun to go back and just relive those times. They were just amazing. I, I kind of stopped talking about it a while ago because my students would come up and say, what's new about that? I learned it in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I got another chance to talk about those wonderful times and I, Hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed making it. This lecture is dedicated to Peter Molnar, my partner in revolutions and a lifelong friend and inspiration. The plate tectonic revolution profoundly changed our worldview. It exploded onto the scene just as I was starting out in geology. Now I know by now that the revolutions must seem like ancient history to many of you, but I thought you might want to hear how it was to be there. When I was growing up, I thought I'd be an artist. Then the Russians launched the satellite Sputnik the first man-made object in space, a whole generation of us switched to science. This will sound crazy in this age, but we were amazed that humans could put something in outer space, in orbit no less. And we thought that if science could do that, it could do anything, solve wars and famine and yeah, we were dreamers. Nonetheless, I enrolled at MIT and began the search for the right undergraduate major. I tried quite a few, but it wasn't until third year that I took a geology course quite by accident and I was immediately hooked. I had always loved being in the wilderness and I love hiking and camping. I love maps. I really thought I had found my calling. That summer I attended summer field camp in Montana and I really loved it. But the field of geology was in great disarray at the time. 
We made our map showing evidence for huge episodes of shortening and extension of the land. But when we asked our mentors what had happened, no one had any ideas. It was as if the hands of some whimsical god had been massaging the land. And then there was the vocabulary. Too much. Maybe this isn't my calling after all. I really needed to take a break and think about it all. And besides, my siblings were in South America having adventures without me. So I dropped out of school and got myself a low-level job in geophysics in Chile. And about halfway through my year there, I attended a lecture by Jim Hertzler. He had just gotten off a ship in a local port and he wanted to tell us about some measurements they had made in the South Pacific. Here's New Zealand and South America and they, they had a ship track right across there. He showed us the record of the magnetic field that they had gathered. This essentially proved that ocean floors are made by seafloor spreading. It was astonishing. If seafloor spreading was true, then so was continental drift, and, and the implications were enormous. And there I was at the end of the Earth, <laughs> missing the revolution. I quick applied to graduate schools, but still, it took six months to finish my job and to get things organized to go to graduate school at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Fred Vine had been through a couple of weeks before, and he had given a lecture, and it was about those same magnetic anomalies. Here's the one that Jim showed us, and then he had crossings of all the other oceans. Clearly, seafloor spreading made all the ocean floors. I wasn't there yet, but I've heard that the whole institution went to this talk, and they were all converted from fixes to drifters in one hour. So when I got to Scripps, it was a total chaos. All those crazy magnetic anomalies that they had been collecting over all the oceans, they had been sitting on a shelf getting dusty, and suddenly they all made sense. So how do marine magnetic anomalies convince us that seafloor spreading is true? It's called the Vine-Matthews hypothesis, and it's a little complicated to explain, so I made some computer animations to help me explain it to my students. First, you have to describe seafloor spreading, and you have to describe the polarity reversals of the Earth's magnetic field. And then you have to combine these two to show how that makes magnetization in stripes on the seafloor, and then how we can measure that. The idea of seafloor spreading is that it creates new ocean floor as the continents drift apart. So as they pull a gap, it pulls up the mantle into that gap. So the mantle melts as it rises, erupts on the seafloor, and makes new ocean crust. The crust that it's making is very thin. It's just that black line there. Then as the crust ages and cools, it freezes on more and more of the mantle to the space. So an oceanic plate is just that thin crust and a lot of mantle glued on. This is very different than the continents. You can see the crust is much thicker and they often have a deep keel of mantle stuck on them. Here's a movie I made showing a close-up of three spreading centers connected by transform faults. You can see the mantle and the lava is rising and freezing to make new ocean floor. Here's a spreading center, a transform fault, spreading center, transform fault, spreading center. Lucky for us, it's basalt that is pouring out and making the new seafloor. And it's a very good recorder of the magnetic field of the Earth at the time. The second thing we need to know is that the Earth's magnetic field, its dipole field, now and then just dies away. And when it grows again, it can be either pointing north like it is now, that's why our compasses work, or it can be pointing south. 
They're called the magnetic reversals. And here's a time scale showing the magnetic reversals through time. Starting at 3 million years, it was normal polarity and then reversed. A short normal, then reversed. That is pointing south, north, south. And then here's the last event, which was a long normal, same as we have now. In this movie, it's the same topography that I had before at the spreading centers, but this time I painted the ocean floor by its polarity. So all this part was magnetized pointing south, it was reversed. This part was magnetized pointing north and so on. And then I included the polarity reversal time scale so we can see what happened through time. Present, let's see, it was a reversed magnetization for a long time. Then there was a short little normal period, then reversed, and then the long normal that's the present. You can see it's making magnetized stripes on the seafloor and they're symmetrical. See, this is the other half of this and so on. That's because the seafloor keeps breaking down the center and sending half of the new seafloor in each direction. If the seafloor is made by seafloor spreading, it should be magnetized in stripes. But the seafloor is under miles of ocean water. How would we ever find out if that's so? We take a research vessel and it tows the magnetometer and the magnetometer measures the strength of the magnetic field. It's measuring it along the top of the ocean and it's mostly measuring the Earth's main dipole field. But superimposed on top of that is this profile and it's just measuring the field from the local rocks that are just under the ship. So you can see here's the central anomaly. This normal adds a little to the field so it's stronger. During a reverse time, it subtracts a little. Notice the symmetry. And some of these are very distinct, like this one we call four fingers jack. And here it is symmetrically on the other side. So I became a wiggle picker. Here's a collection of profiles from the Northeast Pacific. We've been looking at the profiles right near the spreading center, but actually it goes on and on and on and on and on across the seafloor. This is only halfway across the Pacific. You can see there have been lots and lots of reversals over time. Here's the center part. Central anomaly, four fingers jack, and there's cron five. That's one of them that you can see in all the oceans. It's a good friend. Once you work with these for a while, you get to have some favorites, like here's crons 10, 11, 12, and 13. 10 and 11 are double. There's a big negative, just this side of 13. People had made detailed surveys of the ocean floor before all this, and the Navy made this one off of San Francisco and off of Oregon and Washington. And they just steamed their ships back and forth and back and forth. They were mostly interested in the topography of the ocean floor, but since it was easy, they towed a magnetometer as well. And when they profiled up all their lines from the magnetometer, it turned out the seafloor was striped. And here's some that they took over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge just south of Iceland, the same. You can imagine how amazing it was to discover that the seafloor was striped. Then they had no idea why. This is our map as of 1988 of the Northeast Pacific. So here's San Francisco and there's Alaska. And if you look close, you can see here are all the lines of the ships steaming back and forth. These ships were probably going from San Francisco to the Aleutians. They just towed a magnetometer and it measured a field 
along that line. You can see they're wonderfully consistent. Like, see all these wide ones? These? And here's Cron 5, that's always a really big one. But all these others are distinctive too. They're really good, but there still was a problem. That is, you can see we have these stripes labeled with numbers, cron numbers. All these cron numbers are just an arbitrary scale that we made so that we could communicate about various events to each other. We really wanted to know what the age of these reversals was in millions of years so that we could correlate things that we see in the ocean to other events that occurred in Earth history. But getting the age is not so easy. Once the seafloor is made, here's the rocky seafloor, all the debris that's falling out of the water column collects on the seafloor and buries the basement quite deep in sediments. Lucky for us, the deep sea drilling project got going just then. For leg three, they went to the South Atlantic, which seemed to have a very good chance of having a steady spreading rate. Seafloor spreading predicts that the ages we find on the ocean floor will be symmetrical around the spreading ridge. And going from the ridge to the edge will get older and older. So here's the drilling ship, and it's got its drill rig hanging down through all that water and then drilled into the sediments. And each one, they were trying to get to the basement to find out the age when that seafloor was first made. The ages were gotten from microfossils that had collected on the seafloor right after it was made. Well, and here are the results. My gosh. How's that for a straight line? It almost looks too good to be true, but it is true. Seafloor spreading must be true. Once we have the ages, we can turn all of our cron numbers. There's 12, 11, 12, and 13. We could turn them all into ages. And so it makes this map, which I've colored by age. The warmest colors are the youngest rocks. Here's a spreading center still making seafloor. Then as you go out, I've colored them in 10 million year steps by age. So for instance, 40 million years is this color change right in here. These ages are all on the Pacific plate which fills up most of the North Pacific today. But they were made by spreading between it and another plate, the Farallon plate, which is now mostly subducted. There are just a couple little remnants of it left. If we want to know what the spreading system looked like between the Pacific plate and the Farallon plate 40 million years ago, let's see, that's right along here, transform fault ridge, transform fault ridge. We could just cut away everything that was, has been made since then. And there it is. That's what it looked like between the Pacific and Farallon plate. Our map was then added to the whole world's collection. We did this part up here. But all the colleagues had been collecting those magnetic profiles all over all the world. This is the World Ocean Floor Age Map. Here's the translation of the colors into age. So the warmest colors are the youngest, and greens and blues are getting older and older. Look at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge here. It's separating the Americas from Africa and Europe. The ages on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge are youngest at the center and older and older as they go out, and it's symmetrical. And in fact, this shows us something about the original breakup of the Atlantic. You can see North America came away from Africa during the blue time, that's Jurassic, but South America came off later during uh, Cretaceous time, about 40 million years later. You can see in the Pacific that spreading is much faster. That youngest part is much, much wider than it is in the Atlantic. And in the Indian Ocean, you can see it's really very slow spreading on these ridges that are around Africa and quite fast spreading south of Australia. Notice that the Pacific is very asymmetrical. The Pacific plate itself fills up almost the whole basin in the north. 
when we first got going and the people working in the Atlantic kept talking about the mid-ocean ridge, you can imagine this led to some nomenclature arguments in our ocean in the Pacific. It wasn't in the middle of the ocean at all. It's way over at the side. So the marine magnetic anomaly profiles were very powerful. They show us that the ocean crust is formed at seafloor spreading centers. And that in turn gives us the mechanism for continental drift. It's so easy if you can make brand new crest as you spread the continents apart. This is probably the biggest implication. It showed us how different oceanic and continental crust are, and also oceanic and continental lithospheric plates for plate tectonics. Before this time, people talking about what was going on in the ocean were assuming it was some funny version of what was going on on the land, but it's really different. They're two different animals. Here's the implication that I use the most, the ability to quantitatively trace the motions of the plates step by step through 200 million years of geologic time. So when you see a movie like this, of the spreading, all these, all the steps and all the ages were just made using those profiles that we had collected in ships of the magnetic anomalies, or at least that's the main data set for it. Or whenever you hear someone talking about the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea and how all the continents moved to their present positions, all that information is gotten straight from those profiles across the oceans. Have you ever noticed that when there's a new theory, scientists tend to be most convinced by their own data from their own fields? This can lead to serious family arguments, like what was the most convincing data for the revolution? Mine, of course. Well, we never actually came to yelling, but it was tempting. Okay, Peter, I admit it. The seismological data was really cool too. The worldwide seismic net had been established in the 1950s to monitor nuclear test ban treaties. But along the way, it showed us all the locations of the Earth's substantial earthquakes. How's that for a little side effect? This is a map of those earthquake locations. Each dot represents an earthquake greater than magnitude 4.5. And this is just a couple of decades worth of data. The dots wonderfully outline the plates. Here's the North American plate. It's almost like one of those children's connect the dots games. Connect the dots and you can draw your own plate boundaries. At Lamont, they plotted out these earthquakes on a mylar sheet and overlaid it on a hallway world map. And for quite a while, it became the destination of choice for coffee breaks. I visited Lamont during that time and I got stuck too in front of that map for hours. It was just so interesting. We could see that they were small plates like the Caribbean or the Cocos, very large plates like the Pacific plate, that's the biggest one. Some are pure ocean, like these oceanic plates. Most are carrying a mix of continent and ocean, like the Americas or Africa or Eurasia. Notice that the interiors of the plates are pretty quiet. Not perfect, but there are other reasons for earthquakes. Even the continents are not, not too bad. This gave us the courage to assume that the plates move as rigid plates. And that's an assumption we've been testing ever since. And so far, it's holding up most places. In all this excitement, we graduate students became the teachers of the new paradigm. It was rough talking some of those old guys into it, but it was also really fun because we knew we were right. In 1969, Bill Dickinson organized a Penrose conference to get all the field geologists to come together and talk about the new ideas. He invited all those old guys who had been working on the geology of the land forever, and they put us graduate students up front. So there I was going on and on about transform faults and seafloor spreading and so on. And someone from the audience interrupted me. 
do we really have to believe this stuff? But someone else in the audience jumped up. It's true, it's true. That was Ken Shu, and he had been on that deep sea drilling expedition. Apparently, when he got on the ship, he was a skeptic, but when he came off, he had the true passion of the newly converted. One of the really wonderful things about the plate tectonic revolution was that it was so inclusive. It touched all the disciplines of earth science and changed our geological understanding of places all over the world. Every colleague, in every earth specialty, in every location, in every language, they all had pieces to add to the story. And we all had great incentive to listen to one another, try to put it all together. What did all this fuss in the oceans do for continental geology? Well, for one thing, the subduction zones leave their marks on the continents. The Mesozoic rocks in California are a classic example of the geological belts formed by a subduction zone. Here's the topography of California. We have a big mountain range, the Sierra Nevada, big central valley that's full of farms, and then the coast ranges. And the geology coincides. The Sierra Nevada mountains are all carved into granitic batholiths, while the coast ranges are all carved into the Franciscan formation. I can still remember in graduate school when Warren Hamilton put out a paper suggesting that the granodiorite belts were really just the roots of the arc volcanoes at a subduction zone. What did we think of them before? It's a mystery. The Sierra Nevada mountains are wonderful for outings. The pristine granite everywhere makes it for really easy cross-country trips. And if you go to Yosemite National Park, there's big meadows down in here. It's a wonderful place for a picnic surrounded by all those huge walls of granodiorite. It's not very often that you get to eat lunch in the depths of a magma chamber. The coast ranges are completely different. They're all worn into the Franciscan formation. And I can still remember my professors warning us to stay away from the Franciscan. It's a hopeless mess, they said. All the sediments are all broken up and these exotic blocks that are contained in it are just crazy. Chunks of the mantle of high-grade blue chest rocks, of pillow basalts, all sorts of things. And you can see they're just helter-skelter mixed into the broken sediments. Here's a chunk of oceanic crust that got ripped off the seafloor my favorite ocean floor in the sunshine. It turns out it makes total sense. The Franciscan formation is just the accretionary wedge at the front edge of the subduction zone. It's a jumbled heap of buoyant bits that couldn't be subducted into the mantle, so they all collected in this wedge at the front. The Franciscan formation isn't ugly, it's perfect. It's a perfect example of an accretionary wedge. And then, of course, we have the San Andreas Fault. We go on lots of fault trips. Where's the fault in this picture? Or in this one? Where do you suppose it is in this one? Here's a view from an airplane looking south. So this is the Pacific Plate over here headed for Alaska. You can see the fault is offsetting all, every one of these rivers that's coming down the mountainside, one earthquake at a time. Well, it was clear right from the start that the San Andreas system is a primary plate boundary between the Pacific and North American plates. This huge Pacific plate is headed for Alaska and the Aleutians and Japan, and it's just scraping along the edge of North America, and it's broken off a few pieces that it's dragging along. The San Andreas Fault is very clear on the geologic map. Here it goes. And you can see it's cutting obliquely across the Mesozoic subduction belts. And so there are granites way up here that got carried up from down here, more than 500 kilometers. That leaves us with some profound questions about the San Andreas system. What happened to the subduction zone that's so clearly shown in the geology? And how did the San Andreas fault system develop? The key is to realize that the subduction zone was a boundary between North America and the Farallon Oceanic Plate, while the San Andreas was a boundary between North America and the Pacific Plate. 
So to figure out how this works, we have to reconstruct where those oceanic plates were with respect to North America. And to do that, we use plate circuit reconstructions. They go like this. We take this map of ocean floor ages and say we want to know where the material that's right in here was with respect to North America 20 million years ago. You can cut away everything that's younger than 20 million years. And then we can do a plate circuit to reconstruct these. First, we reconstruct the Pacific to Antarctica, then the two of them to Africa, and all three of them to North America. And we can go back and see where this part of the Pacific plate ended up with respect to North America. I've made movies of the history of the oceanic plates inside the Pacific Basin. And I did it by doing those round the world circuit reconstructions for a lot of different ages. So I'll show this a few times. First, let's watch the Pacific plate. It was moving northward most of the time, or northwestward. But meanwhile, it was having material added on its side by seafloor spreading. So by the time we get to the present, the Pacific is filling up the whole North Pacific Basin. Now let's watch the Farallon Plate. It was subducting like crazy under North America, and this is just the last part of its subduction history. It subducted so much that sections of it were completely subducted, and suddenly the Pacific Plate and North America began to interact with each other. And that's San Andreas. Let's look closer. This time we're starting at 38 million years. First, it was all subduction. But then the Farallon Plate completely disappeared down the subduction zone, and the North American and Pacific Plates began to interact, first in this northern short part and later on farther south. Here's the San Andreas part of the plate boundary on the land that we were looking at. And then that plate boundary continues down through the small spreading centers in the Gulf of California. This helps us with the timing of the San Andreas. It couldn't possibly have started until 25 million years ago when, they, when the two plates made contact and it developed in steps. As the plate boundary grew longer and longer, bigger and bigger pieces were ripped off of North America. And in fact, today, there's a new plate boundary forming back here. That's through Death Valley and behind the Sierra Nevada. In the near future, us coastal folks aren't going to Alaska by ourselves. We're going to take most of California with us. Here's another thing that the reconstructions help us understand. Have you ever noticed that the edge of North America has a big bulge in it? That formed during the time of the San Andreas. During the development of the San Andreas, the Pacific Plate wasn't actually going straight up the coast. It was going a little bit offshore. And so it pulled out the whole edge of North America with it. It's still a little offshore. 30 million years ago, the edge of the continent was pretty straight. But by today, it's pulled out almost 300 kilometers. This predicts there must be something drastic happening back inside the continent. And indeed there is, here's California. See all this region? It looks really stretched and it is, that's the Basin and Range Province. And in fact, in the narrow part of it here, it was extended more than 100%. Meanwhile, Peter was working on the tectonics of Southeast Asia. It's totally dominated by the collision of India into the underbelly of Eurasia. He made circuit reconstructions to describe the motions of India and its collision with Eurasia. And he started with the world map. Let's say we want to reconstruct to 50 million years ago. We take away everything that's younger than that, reconstruct the pieces, and we can see where India was at that time. 
and he did a bunch of reconstructions and you can see it come flying in. I made a movie of that collision for Peter for a birthday present. Here's the suture between the two continents. And there are the high Himalayan peaks. They're all made out of frontmost slice of India. Here's the Tibetan plateau. You can see it's been hugely thickened and uplifted. And that's what makes that huge high plateau. Let's try that again. This is our planet's primo mountain range. When you fly across the plains of India and look up, these are clouds, but those are Himalayan peaks. Tough field area, Peter. Those are people down there for scale. And there's a village for scale. How do you like that fold? Oh, what a beautiful planet we have. I feel wonderfully lucky to have been part of this amazing, magical time and to have shared it with so many passionate colleagues, including many of you. Thanks. Thanks to John Iwerks for his crazy sketches and animation art. And thanks to this list of friends who helped me figure out how to put this talk together. In case you couldn't tell, this talk was really to show off my animations. They're at this website, or you can find that by doing a search for Atwater Animations. And all the materials on that website are there free to download and use any way you wish. Enjoy them. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> awesome. Um, we do have a number of questions that have popped up in the uh, Q and A thing. So if you've got a little patience and time, we could uh, delve into that. I think uh, we, we we're in good time in terms of any sort of schedule. Um, I'm from Jonathan Starr. Does the San Andreas Fault correspond to the subducted spreading center between the Farallon and Pacific plates? Or does the subducted spreading produce a zone of weakness that enables the San Andreas Fault zone to exist? Well, the main thing that happened when the, the spreading center was subducted was that the, there wasn't an intervening plate between the Pacific and North America anymore. And so they just started rubbing on each other. Mid-ocean mid midges are often subducted. That that's, comes as a surprise to a lot of people, but there's one in South America that's being, being subducted right this minute. And there's some, um, and there's plenty, you can make a case for plenty of them in the past. Hmm. It just changes the relationship of the two plates that are um, rubbing against each other. Yeah. One of the points you made there was about how uh, the, the, the sort of per personal dyna dam dynamics of the time between, between scientists. And there's a question here from Brian Lovell. Um, at Harvard in the 1960s, Ray Sevier and Miriam Kastner stood out as understanding the plate tectonic revolution. Most members of staff were hostile to the hypothesis. Why was there such resistance to the ideas? When did you feel conviction became general? The two two aspects to that. What, what 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 was causing the resistance, and then when did it when when has it ever become general? I mean, there are still. Is it totally accepted now? I I haven't met anybody in the last twenty or thirty years who would admit that they don't believe it. <laughs> but to begin with, it, it was um, especially the people working way inside the continents. It just didn't do anything for them, except in a very big way, big general way, carrying the continents around. But um, mostly, I think they didn't need it. 
And so there's always resistance to something that does, is irrelevant to you. Um, I, it was really fun to watch it get into the textbooks because to begin with, there was this little chapter so they, they got added on at the end saying, oh yeah, and there's these ideas. And then they then all the ideas begin to sneak into the information in the, all the chapters. And by now, it almost doesn't even mention it, except it's the background for everything. So it was really, it took about 10 years to get start creeping into the all of the geology, but it was fun to watch it. So I should I should mention Tanya that you're getting a, a, a great uh, <laughs> great commentary on the, um, on the <laughs> chat here. Uh, we must capture this for you, uh, uh, but you've been you've been um, labelled. I, I know I've I've heard of the uh, Tanya Atwater as the mother of plate tectonics, and, yeah. and you knew yourself quiz quip that you are the grand perhaps the grandmother these days of it uh, but there's one here uh, that talks about you being the, uh, the, the, the I've missed it now I've lost it now but the global the, a global person of of tectonics um, I'll, I'll, I'll find it anyway um, uh, so as someone who struggles around continents um, one of the things that I envy about what you did and what, what continues to be is there is a, a great simplicity in, in the oceans. I mean, it, it's obviously in detail, it's complex, but there is a huge simplicity in, in, in how you think of it and how that the complexity can have that context of just simplicity. And you showed a bit of your, your, how that interaction happens at continental margins. But clearly there is still a lot of deformation within continents some you know thousands of kilometers away from their margins have you, do you have any have you ever thought about the equivalent of that and how that all works out where we're going with that because the more papers that are written the more complexity we introduce to it rather than more simplicity and it, it, it's it's it doesn't seem to be going in the right direction well the the marine papers really pretty much hang in there with it being simple and clear. I mean, that's thank goodness, or we'd never figure it out because <laughs> all that water's in the way and then all that mud. So it has to be simple. But then you think, well, maybe we're just saying it's simple because we can't. But every every test we try, it keeps on being true. The, the disadvantage of that is that it is being subducted, you know, so we're just making new crust and and subducting the old. On the continents, everything's mostly still there, or at least remnants of it. And so, of course, it's going to be much more complicated. All the new, all the new things are superimposed on the older ones, and all kind of not in organized in space the way it is for the oceans. So. Were you saying that the continents tend to get more and more complicated as we go? Is that what? Well, I, I wonder if they become more complicated or we make them more complicated. I suppose that's my quandary. Well, come on. You're trying to do four and a half billion years of history. Well, then that's, that's the third. What's the, what's, the simple, what's the equivalence? I mean, I agree. I, I understand that. But right. we, so, we, we, we complicate it with language and, uh, and well, with language, perhaps, is the, is the really well, big yeah, it's just just natural. The more we look into something, the more we learn about it. And I, I actually, I really thought the play, the oceans would get more much more complicated too, but they haven't. <laughs> so it's really a, it's a continental problem, and it's lucky that it's right under our feet. But we are at any given place, just looking at one moment in time, sometime in the past when we're looking at the rocks, and so. It's, it's amazing we can sort anything out, actually. I'm very impressed. I've discovered what, the, so it was Dawn Wright who describes you as a global treasure. Uh, so I guess you know Dawn. Uh, um, that was what I was looking for. Um, the, so I think, I think we've probably more or less run out here. But there's one further question here about, um, there's lots of commentary, by the way, and just people just 
<laughs> raving about the talk. So thank you very much for that. I mean, that's just great. Uh, how, how do you see then? What is the future of of, of, ex, of exploration of the oceans? Where where is it all going? Is it is it is it is there is there tectonics to be solved, or is it all about the biology of the oceans and the the carbon? The acidity, the the you know, where is oceanic geology and oceanic science going? Well, that complaining I was doing about the mud on the seafloor, I mean, it has a wonderful story, right, encapsulated in it, and we're just figuring out how to read it. And so, I, I think the oceans, on the land, you're constantly eroding things off, so we keep losing records. But they're they're at least for the last. 200 million years, they're all captured and saved for us if we can figure out how to look at all, look down inside the sedimentary pile. So I, I think that's um, that's where we're going for paleoclimate and for an understanding uh, the evolution of life, all sorts of things are in, in the sediments. I never thought I would say this because I always thought, oh, sediments, that's dirt. <laughs> But they're, they're very rich. Well, I, I, right, I'm going to draw this to a close, but there's, there's one last question that uh, <laughs> I can't resist terribly. Um, <laughs> it, and it's not surprisingly from Dan McKenzie. Uh, your lovely talk reminded me of what fun it was to be young when a whole subject changed. Do you think it's going to happen again? I'm not sure whether he's referring to Dan and you being young again. Or whether there's going to be this big change again, but perhaps you could answer both. <laughs> um, well, we've kind of um, used up our time, I'd say. <laughs> Though who knows if you come back again? But uh, <laughs> let's see. I I I can't imagine that there would be another big revolution like this one that we came through. It changed so many things and put so many things into place that we just couldn't understand before. And it keeps standing the tests of time. I, I keep expecting to find out that the plates aren't at all rigid or this or that, or, but it's, it's really hanging together. This, this part of the story I was talking about. So I, at first I was a little disappointed that the field just left the ocean, marine geophysics and they're doing other things. But of course, <laughs> maybe we did too good of a job. <laughs> you may have done too good of a job, yeah. But uh, actually there's one good question here, John, Jonathan Starr. Serpentine, serpentinite is a signature presence of subduction zones, but he doesn't know how, uh, or doesn't have a definitive explanation of how it forms and how it reaches the surface. Can you provide one? <laughs> well, the serp serpentine and even more blue schist rocks blue that are down in the subduction zone, they're very distinctive. If you see a blue schist rock, you know it's been taken way down into the earth in a, in a relatively cold place where the subduction zones are carrying cold down into the earth all the time. Uh, wait, hey, what was the question? Oh, so as far as the serpentine, the reason that shows up so much is because when you rip off a chunk of oceanic crust, remember it's very, very thin. And so you all very often get a chunk of the mantle as well. The continents are so much thicker, we're really lucky if we ever see a piece of the mantle. But so that's was part of the reason the deep sea drilling got going was because it, there was a chance in the oceans that we could get a piece of the mantle. And mantle rocks, if you just add water and wait around a little, you'll get serpentine. So it's, it's really just a very good indicator that we're, we're including in the accretionary wedges chunks of the mantle. Um, right. Wait, oh, and how did it get back up? Well, I, back I, wish, up, yeah. I wish I knew, but remember that my picture of the the countryside with all those hunks of stuff sticking out and yeah. they're all mixed into unmetamorphosed sediments that are all broken up and just they're the ground mass and so it's clear that the stuff that's been down deep in the subduction zone has 
somehow gotten itself back to the surface. I suppose it was too buoyant to to go on down into the mantle, and but it, you have to postulate some kind of circulation in that. So the mix master is working on it, <laughs> on the accretionary wedge yeah. so that you end up with very high grade things all cheek by gel with unmetamorphosed things. Yeah. Um, Pretty good. Okay. I wish I knew why they came up. I mean, I wish I knew it had a better picture for it. Around California, there are lots of places where the San Andreas system pulls open holes. And what comes up are the, the deep, um accretionary wedge rocks because they're plastered under there and if you just can open a hole and look and kind of slurp it up there it is cool um i think we'll draw this to a close uh thank it's uh it's been great tanya so well, it's been an adventure <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for spending this time. Well, yes, your story is an adventure, but thank you for spending this time. Well, with I, meant, I meant making this movie <laughs> since I've oh. never done that before. <laughs> quite, quite like that. But it, and just, yeah, my whole life's been a wonderful adventure with so many different people in all sorts of different beautiful places. We had just have to go and visit all the mountains since you can't carry them into the lab. Darn. <laughs> Well, I think that's quite, that's a good, good, good line to finish on, actually, because uh, there's a, there's a, we have a big debate, I'm sure you do in the States, about uh, how fieldwork is, is actually becoming almost, not obsolete, but a secondary part of our science. And what you just said is, I think, really profoundly important, that you have to, you have to go in the field to appreciate the rocks and appreciate the scale of what happens to them. And uh, it's not enough just to be in a labor laboratory doing, doing uh, modeling. The, the, the basics of observational science uh, are what is the grandeur of what we, we do. And um, It is. And every time you go to a new place, you learn something new because each place is, has a little <laughs> different um well par partly a different way that it worked but also just the different uh rocks that happened to be left we're just lucky to have a few that are left and that didn't get eroded away or done in great thank you so thanks again for spending this time with us uh again our congratulations on the award of the last medal it's the highest honor of the geological society of thank london uh, uh, it was the highest medal we can bestow on anybody. And thanks again also for this great talk that, uh, well, we, we, we must preserve the commentary on it because you'll see the impact you've had on a whole bunch of people. Um, I'm sure it will penetrate far and wide over the web in the coming weeks. And uh, we've all got uh, animation at water in our head now yes. we, we need. So, uh, Please use them. They're getting old fashioned fast. So. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I think they may be, they may be, they may have just come back into fashion. Hmm. Um, and it's been great to see you again and really uh, it's on the screen. What, what a surprise mm -hmm. <laughs> to come back together after all that time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it just remains for me to thank uh, the Geological Society staff and in particular Chrissy, yes. Kevin, Becky and Alicia for holding this whole event together and for, uh, I, I know, I, I think you found them initially irritating <laughs> <laughs> and then tremendously helpful and useful and that's, I think that's both of those things that they've really? done. So, uh, so thanks to, thanks guys for, uh, for making this happen and, and actually that was flawless, I think. So fantastic. Um, and finally, I'd like to say a, a, a big thanks to uh, the Society Awards Committee for all the work they do to cause this great event to happen year after year. Uh, and also to the people who nominate their colleagues for these awards. Um, I want to try to save the chat so you can read them. The, uh, the acknowledgement, I think that uh, sounds like Keith on, can we stay silent? The acknowledgement and the stories from individuals nominated by their community are great inspiration both the young people and less young people 
uh, but all practitioners of our science and therefore it's a, this is a really com important component of what we do as a society and uh, I just encourage people to to nominate and to share this uh, to get people they know who are passionate about it to share that with with us all so thank you thank you again Tanya and uh, I think that calls it a day for now uh, and um, goodbye <laughs>